All right, so you want to get into Blender to make low poly slash PS2 animations for your music videos, edits, whatever. Let's talk about it. No gatekeeping, just creating. I'm going to be showing you how I made this animation from start to finish, showing you all the steps of my process from creating character, decorating the scene, animating, and adding some finishing touches. I'm going to try to make this tutorial as a beginner friendly as possible and point you to other tutorials for more explanation on certain parts, but I highly recommend you have at least watched the Blender Donut tutorial series before watching this video, just so you understand the basics of navigation and a lot of the key terms that I'll be referencing. I know you want to make sick animations like these, not a donut, but trust me, it is essential and a very helpful guide for the basics. If you don't watch it, and if you do watch it, you might get lost very quickly in this tutorial, and it's not as complex as, as it seems, I promise you that. Just give yourself some time and try to take these one step at a time. And the best part of this tutorial is everything you see here, from the software to the assets to whatever, it's all free. And you can do this all for free. Blender is free. I'm sure you know that if you watched this video already, but it's crazy to think Blender, as powerful a tool as this is, is free. With that being said, there are already so many amazing Blender tutorials out there that cover similar topics to what I'm about to. However, beyond just wanting to make a tutorial because people have asked to see my process, at the start of my journey, I always wished there was one simple guy that showed me every step of the process from start to finish to create animation like this. From creating my character to enemy in the camera, one that helped me understand the whole bigger picture. That's exactly what this tutorial is going to be. I, by no means, am any sort of Blender expert. To be honest, there's still so much I don't know, but I do think I could provide some insight into what I do know and help others who are just starting the journey. Just like how I do physical mixed media animation, 3D is just one of the tools I use in my editing toolkit. I don't have the time to spend all day in Blender. I wish I could, but it's limited and I have to work on tight deadlines to fit stuff into the videos I'm working on. So, I've slowly found a workflow that works great for me for this exact purpose. There's probably going to be some steps in here that other creators or even yourself might know how to do better. And if that's the case, please let me know and leave it below in the comments for others to find out. But like my last tutorial, the goal here isn't for you just to copy my animation one-to-one. -one. It's for you to understand the steps that go into the process so you can take this knowledge and apply it to your own workflow and find the process you enjoy the most. But before we get started, I just want to thank our sponsor, us. We just opened up a Patreon for our channel. It's a place to not only support us here at Dumb Days, but also get access to all sorts of goodies. Patrons get early access to our videos, giveaways, discounts. Most importantly, can get a lot of exclusive, more in-depth content tutorials. In the Patreon, we break it down any and all of our music videos and animations, showing you the project files and answering any questions you might have. We also will be posting video discussions on tips and advice that can help you on your freelancing slash creative journey. Free tutorials like this outside of Patreon won't stop. However, the Patreon will just be a place where we can get more in-depth in a more frequent basis. If you're a 3D artist, editor, director, whatever, there'll be lots of awesome stuff and useful things for you in there. Please check it out. Of course, the Patreon is now required, but truly, any penny helps support us, and I'm so grateful for the community we built so far. The past few months has been insane, and I get all sorts of messages from you guys saying how we inspire you or how you appreciate we don't gatekeep, and that's what we're all about. I just really appreciate and love every single one of you. Thank you guys. Okay, that's it. Sorry to interrupt. Let's get to the tutorial. Okay, great. Well, here we are in Blender. Before we get started, I just want to talk a little bit more about low poly and introduce you to some basics. Like, what is it? I get all technical on you, but I'm too lazy to do that. So in a very simple way, low poly means the actual geometry of the model is made of as little polygons, aka shapes, as possible. This is mostly due to technical limitations of the time. If you look at models of N64 games, PS1 games, you see that they're actually very, very, very simple. They just have a very smart texture laying over them. And if you watch your animations, they're super choppy and basic, which is awesome for someone like me and don't have forever to animate your characters. There could be a million reasons why you want to do low polys at a modern and more complex look, but for me, it's just fun. Every time I make animations, I try to make it feel like it's straight out of a bargain bin PS2 disc. So really quickly, before we dive in too far deep into things, I just kind of want to show you some very basic settings just in case things start looking a lot different for you if these aren't set up right. Um, I'm gonna go more in detail about some post-processing and like specific things at the very, very end but it's the most basic things like render engine and resolution. I just want you to know that way in case things start looking different, you don't just like get freaked out and confused and like I miss a step. Very simply, we're gonna be using the EV render engine. If you know EV versus Cycles, um, Cycles is a way more realistic kind of engine. It kind of, it portrays lighting and reflectors and shadows way more naturally. Um, realistically, just all sorts of crazy math that we'll get into now to provide realistic reflections and shadows. Um, EV creates fake shadows. Um, obviously cycles looks better, but Eevee saves you like a hundred times faster render times. 
um, especially for our low poly look we're going for now, we don't need cycles. Cycles is overkill. Cycles is arguably better, but it's just not going to, it doesn't matter for these kind of retro looks that we're going for. They didn't have that technology back in the day. Um, so you can play around with cycles if you want on your own time. I think it's cool to use sometimes. Like I use it for like image renders. Like if I'm doing a cover art image, like I'll use cycles because it takes forever to render one image, but it's going to have way more realistic uh, reflections and whatnot. So I think it's pretty cool. But for the sake of this tutorial, we're using EV, and usually that's way better because it's way more approachable on, on any and all hardware. Um, and also just like, it, it's just easy. Um, so we're going to be using that. Another thing to keep in mind is, again, I'm going to go over all these different settings later on, uh, but on our um, output properties, our resolution. By default, it's set to 1920 by 1080. I believe in the actual animation portion of this tutorial, I'm actually at 1600 by 1200, if you see this right here. Um, it, it doesn't matter all th that's the really resolution I chose because I was using that resolution on a music video I was already working on so I just matched it it doesn't matter use whatever resolution you want typically it'll be 1920 by 1080 maybe even higher than that maybe go 2k 4k up to you your choice do whatever you want um, it's something you can tweak in later on as well you don't need to decide right away because all it's going to do is just change um, the crop like if, for example if we look at our camera, this is our camera view. If we just switch to 1920, you know, it's, it's just going to change the crop. It's not going to change anything too major. So we could play around with it. In terms of frame rate, um, that is your choice as well. Um, if you're using animations um, in a music video, I would recommend you go 23.98 because that is probably what you shot the rest of the video in or, some, or whatever shot the video in. Um, however, if you're doing it on your own, uh, for your own little animation, you're, you're particularly going for that game feel. I recommend 30 or 29.7. Um, that's the more, that's what games used to play at actually, which is a kind of a little more of a smoother experience. Um, modern games play at 60, which is really cool. Um, and you could do that as well. I believe Instagram takes uh, 20, takes 23.97, uh, 30 and 60. Um, just only note that you, if you're, you know, deciding between 30 and 60, uh, you probably should know beforehand because it's going to change the timing of your entire animation. Obviously, if we have an animation that's 300 seconds long and then we want to make it 30 FPS, it's going to be 10 seconds of an animation. If we're doing 60 FPS at 300 uh, frames, that's going to be uh, five seconds, right? So uh, just know that going into it. I don't think 60, 60 is cool, but it's going to be overkill. I recommend 30 or 24, it really 23 rather. It really depends on personal preference, but I just want to lay these out for you very basically before we get into it, just in case you're like, things are looking differently. This is all totally optional and it's by personal preference, but those are my settings. So one of the first steps for even create a character is kind of what are we going after? What's the look? I mean, I know we want PS1 low poly kind of look, but what's the idea? And this really depends on what the context of your animation is. Um, obviously like, you know, situations where you have a specific idea in mind, like how when I made animation for our immersive mirth drop and it was on movie theater like i had the idea in my head so i knew what i was going for i knew what style i wanted whatever but uh in this beginning stage of, of the whole process of inspiration research like you just got to kind of look around and i think pinterest is a great spot for that uh looking up low poly looking up ps1 looking on sketchfab uh which is another website which i'll go into more later like just to see what's possible and what's a style you might want to kind of go after. Like, what's some ideas? Like, I love to watch old retro games on YouTube, like watch Let's Plays of the first Resident Evil and just get a sense of the feel of the world, that kind of stuff. Um, and speaking of Resident Evil, that's kind of like what the vibe of this I, wa I know I wanted to be like. Like, you know, these these are animations that I'm using to fill up um, some scenes in a music video. Um, so I know an intention going in that I wanted a haunted house, spooky, Resident Evil like kind of vibe. Um, I knew that was always my intention. That's what I wrote in the treatment. That's what I kind of always uh, saw. Uh, but if I don't know what I'm doing, uh, usually I just look for research. You know, if, if, I'm, if I'm going off music video, I'll, I'll think I'll you know think of the vibe of that video and then find references and just kind of gather ideas. The point of this is not to take ideas and copy it. That's not what research is. Research is just gathering inspiration. It's like looking at stuff that just might trigger an idea. But it's a very helpful spot, especially if you're kind of stuck on that blank page of like, what am I going to animate? Um, don't be afraid to look at reference and to gather inspiration. It's really important. With that all being said, let's get into the first step, creating your character. Now, if you're totally new, I really recommend watching this Animal Crossing tutorial above. Uh, it's a great introduction showing you the basics of modeling and how you can make a character from reference. When it comes to modeling, 
There's about a million ways you can approach it. However, I typically follow a method similar to what's shown in that video, which is taking a reference and building a shape around it, usually starting from just a simple cube shape. Modeling can be really tricky, but it's honestly, the more you do it, the more you get used to it. Um, and starting from references is a great start. I really recommend watching this tutorial. We're not gonna go into detail on modeling a character in here. Uh, as you'll see in a second, we're actually gonna be using an asset, uh, but it is a very simple thing. And, and, and the more you do it, the more you get used to it. I found this awesome base model on Sketchfab by an artist named Benrax. This one comes pre-textured and rigged, which are both gonna change and start from scratch, but it's a great start. Usually on my own projects, I'll make my own model from scratch, but using resources like this is a great start since technically low poly characters like this are really all gonna look the same mesh wise. There's not too much you can do to change it. Um, it's all about the texture, which is how we're gonna change the detail and make it look like our own. Uh, in the down in the description, you can have all the assets from today's videos, but you're gonna have my finished character asset that I'm gonna change. Uh, if you wanna start from scratch, other, the other down link will be in the description as well from the Vinrax. Uh, awesome, awesome, awesome uh, model. Thank you so much for creating it. Again, it's great to make your own models in the future, but if you're just starting out, sometimes it's great to use resources like this uh, that are made for you to make your life easier because again, it's all in the it's all in the texture really for these kind of models. So once you got that downloaded, it's gonna come as an FBX. FBX is just a type of uh, file type for these kind of these kind of models. I uh, come up here on the top left and go to File Import. Again, it could come in many other options. See what it is first. Uh, usually, it'll be OBJ or FBX. I got our case FBX. So we're gonna go into it. And again, I'm just gonna show you the top of the file in case you have it. So we go to source, hero, here to FBX. Click it and boom, we're inside. Now it looks great. You can see that it's a pretty basic model. It's kind of a little more detailed than you would normally would see. Uh, but w one thing you really that's cool to note about uh, PS1 and PS2 models and low poly models in general is a lot of times they'll be segmented. Um, if you look at like the shoulder, how that's different than the arm and the arm is different than the hand. This helps you a lot on the rigging process because if you look at old models and animations, they're very like choppy and blocky and it's because you segment them um, to allow you for more flexibility um, instead of like perfectly meshing together and like it's a whole other thing you'll see when we go into rigging it. If you have a more complex models, sometimes things don't bend the way you want, but having them segmented helps a lot with that kind of stuff. If you hold down Z and we go into material preview, uh oh, it's purple. That's not what we wanted. <laughs> What we saw on the website was a beautiful texture of what seems like a man, so why is it looking purple? It's pretty simple, actually. Purple on this color means you're missing a texture. Um, and if you saw before when I was finding the file for the person uh, in my in my downloads, there was a texture folder, so why is this missing? Um, sometimes it just happens randomly. If you're downloading my character, it might not even happen to you. It might be perfectly linked. But in some case where it is, what we'll do is we'll go down here to this little icon. It could be anywhere else, could be up here, but we're gonna go down here to this icon and we're gonna switch to shader editor. And what this opens up is essentially just an editor for the material of our selected object. So if you select nothing, um, you know, this, this will only appear for what we're currently selecting. So in which case our hero in that model. Um, and you know, there's a lot of things you can go into for materials. Um, you know, this allows you to tweak the roughness, the the shininess, the glossiness, um, the kind of texture of what it is. Um, but you'll see that there's a node attached to a base color, and that's an image texture. Um, and that's the texture we're trying to do. Um, and you'll see that it already has a name and linked out, but it's for some reason it's not showing up. So we're gonna hit this open image, and it should right away bring us to what we need to do. Because most of the time, the files there are for some reason it's not linked properly. In which case, we'll see it, it's right here, and we hit open. And boom, now the texture is laid out perfectly. And just for you to understand what's going on here, how is how is it, if you saw that, let's switch over here to um, UV editor, you'll see that this is a texture to give us. How the hell did this monstrosity of, a, of an image turn to this? And that's kind of the magic of, of old retro texturing and these kind of things, of how they're able to turn this. And if you, if you pay attention, it's a 256 by 256 pixel image, which if you know a thing about images, it's super, super small. How the hell did they get this to make it look like that? And it's something called UV mapping. Um, I won't go too much in detail about this. The frog texture goes into it because we're not going to be using that going over today. It is a great thing for you to understand for when you want to texture and make your own things. But very, very simply, what it's doing, if you go in edit mode, hold down tab and go to edit. If we click, hit A to select everything, we see that all these faces, all these little, these weird little shapes are perfectly coincided with parts of the texture. And what are these things? 
well, it's actually the faces of her model. So if you hit like here on his chest, we see that that's a little cube right there. And so what happened is that we use something called UV unmapping, which essentially is reading the faces of these of this model and projecting them onto this image and maneuvering it. So if you see if I like select this and maneuver it over his face, now his chest is his face. Going back to this texture, this is awesome. This is a really cool character. I love how it's designed, but it's not what we want. And we also just want don't want to just take this guy's asset and use it as our own fully. What we're going to do rather is make it our own. We're going to make this character look like this person, it, it, which is Sawyer, my friend, who's in the music video. So how are we going to do that? There's a lot of ways to go about that. One way is, is doing something called texture painting, which if you hold down tab and go to texture paint, it brings us up. And there's some things you need to do to make sure this is set right first, but for us, it's going to work right now. And what allows you to do is very simply paint over a texture. Now, I love texture painting. It's great. It's kind of what I use the most, to be honest. Um, if you look at our Mii Fighter, which I'll show on screen right now, I texture painted that model. Uh, the Frog tutorial does texture painting as well. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's essentially just letting you paint over something and, and, and is letting you draw out, if you see over here, it's essentially doing the same as creating this texture, but you're doing it within Blender. And it's really cool. It's great. It's fun, especially if you have one of those tablets that lets you draw on your screen. Um, it's a really cool, fun thing, but sometimes it's not, it's not as easy as, as creating a texture like this. So we're not going to be texture painting today, but it is a cool tool I want to show you guys very simply. Rather, we're actually going to be taking this image right here and bringing it into our image editor of choice, whether it be Photoshop, GIMP, whatever software you want to use, ours being Photoshop, and we're going to repaint this to look like what we want it to look like. And the cool thing about doing it this way is that Essentially, like I'm going to repaint the, the, the hair, I'm going to change the eyes, I'm going to change the shirt, change the pants. And when I bring it back into Blender, it's as simple as replacing that texture image file we replaced earlier when the screen was purple into this one and it'll perfectly map how we want it, which is awesome. So let's bring this into Photoshop and do our thing. Awesome. So we are in Photoshop. This part of the process will be super quickly. I just kind of want to show you the basics of what you can kind of do here. Um, again, you don't have to use Photoshop. You can use whatever you want. Uh, but for our sake, we have Photoshop maybe loaded up with this image up and ready. So there's multiple ways you can go about this, but our main goal is to take this right here. This is break down this man and make look this beautiful man right here, Sawyer. Um, so when you change the hair, when you change the shirt, when you change the jeans, and when you just make it look more like him, the more details are better. Um, and there's a few ways to go about this. What I did was I essentially just took a paintbrush and I painted over his hair and other parts I didn't like. Um, and um, one thing to note too is I, I, I just dragged the same image into Photoshop. Make sure you're working on a 256 by 256 um, image size. Um, you want to keep it small because when we export it, it's going to pixelate it, which is also what helps us add, um, hide a lot of the details. Um, so yeah, I took a brush tool and I made him blonde. <laughs> You'll see looks pretty gross again this is the beauty of the pixelation and the fact that it's a small file size it's going to make this look a lot better than it looks like right now but i did that very simply i changed the eyes i added some blondness to it again make sure you follow you just ping it over where it is because this is going to be perfectly mapped for when we bring it back in then um using a selection tool i took the jeans and i added a tint to it so i made it look um a little brighter more like the image and i added the shirt to be red and I added some text over it. Um, and now look at this, we completely changed the texture. It is looking much more like our friend. Um, and this might, if you're making something completely on your own, this might take some maneuvering of kind of putting in Photoshop, putting it back in Blender, seeing what it looks and coming back and forth. Um, but if you do it right, it's gonna look like this and this is pretty awesome. Um, and there's a few more things you can do from here. And, but this is really the kind of basics of it. So what we do from now is that we would export this out as a PNG. Um, and bring it back into Blender. Let's go do that. All right, we are back in Blender and we have our texture ready to go. So here's what we do, very simply. Select your character, go back to Shader Editor. It's already open right now for me, but make sure you find Shader Editor. And again, just a general tip, like to be able to switch tabs and, and switch modes like this, it works on anything. You can go like, this is the same thing right here. You can change this to, sh to Shader Editor. You can change that to Shader Editor. You can change up here to Shader Editor. You can go the shading right here and do it. It doesn't matter. Uh, Blender is really cool modular in that sense, but I love to do stuff on the bottom right here. Um, but anyway, so we have our object, we select it, brought it up, and now we can see again, we have the basic breakdown of the texture, but again, we this is what we're looking for, this image texture. So we go here to the folder icon, open it up, 
and go to wherever you saved your thing. For my case, it was just the opening of this folder. We have our Sawyer PNG and click. And boom, look at that. Looking beautiful. See how it completely transformed this character into our own? Um, and there's a lot more you can do here. For me, I know what I did was I actually went in onto the, onto the texture, or sorry, the model, go edit mode, and I played around with the hair. You can see actually right here is on perfect. Uh, what you could do here um, is go to your UV uh, editor, and you'll see that we have selected just this face. Should be right. It's right here. Um, and if you select it here, we can actually move it around. All right, just move the shape around. Because I actually missed some stuff up there, so that's my fault. You can move it around and you can play around with things, you know, change it how you like. But what I also did too was that if you look at the, my image reference, um, Sawyer's hair is a little bit different than this. It's not as like clean. So we could go around here is you can go around and hitting one on edit mode to bring up the, the vertexes. Uh, the vertex is not right, but you know what I mean. Um, and using G, you can kind of maneuver the hair to look a little more, more like what you're looking for. Um, so I forgot exactly what I did here, but I just kind of went through and and like played around with it and made it look a bit more long at some parts. And you can even go in and add in, um, hit control T or sorry, control R. And what it allows you to do is add in more loops using a loop cut. So you can cut like right here. And now this is Splendor 2, so I have a little bit more flexibility for how I want to move things. But yeah, this is another one of those things where you can just kind of change it at your own leisure. Um, but essentially, you made your own character and it's awesome. So now that we have our character set up, our next step we'd want to do is rig it. And what rigging means is essentially just adding control to your character so you can pose it and do whatever you want to it. If you've noticed, these little things right here are actually the bone. This is, this is the rig. So if you go to pose, hold down tab, go to pose mode, and hold down Z and bring up the bone x-ray if it's not already there. Um, this is our rig, this is our controller. What this allows us to do is very simply, selecting one of the bones, hitting R for rotate, we can move the character around. Um, and on low poly models, this rigging is pretty simple. Like you can see there's, there's really minimal bones and it's okay if it looks a little janky. You see how it's kind of segmented. Uh, on other models, more complex ones, you would do something called shape keys. Uh, which I believe are right here, shape keys. And what this allows you to do is essentially just state, create states where you can change the, the mesh. So say like when you're moving his arm, um, you don't like, you don't like, like this. You don't like this little crease of the elbow. Well, you can create a shape key where you actually fix the mesh right here to make it look more smooth. And then whenever you're animating with that particular thing, you change the shape key and it looks better. To be honest, I rarely do that. I only do that in more complex models. Uh, for low poly ones, if you look at, again, more examples of how it used to be, like it was so janky. Like it used to take years, to, not years, but it would take you take artists so long to even do the most basic tasks that they're not gonna worry about that. Um, so you don't really need to unless you want to, but this allows us to, this allows us to, to manipulate our character however you want. Um, and that's great, but not all, tech, not all models, especially your own, are gonna come rigged. So how do you rig one? So let me introduce you to my little friend called Mixamo. You ever heard of Mixamo? It's a free tool, including your Adobe subscription, that allows you to essentially upload your own character, your humanoid character, and create animations and rig it in seconds, literally seconds. You could take, just take your object, you'll see here, put in a Mixamo, do a little bit of maneuvering to set the points of where his wrists are and where, and where all that kind of stuff. And within second, it's gonna create an awesome um, character for you. Um, and with all these animations, you can, you can scroll through, you can see there's, you know, hundreds of animations and characters you can use. And what's cool about that is that, yeah, you have animations and these are great for base, for base animations, but when you bring it back into Blender, it's going to rig it for you perfectly. So if you're lazy, um, and you don't want to go through rigging stuff, just literally drag your character into Mixamo. You don't even need to use one of the animations, just download it and then be able to, you will have a rig that's functioned really properly, um, for you already. If you don't have Mixamo, which is awesome, but if you don't have a Adobe subscription, rigging is not that hard. Um, there's a lot of tools out there. There's Auto Rig Pro, I believe, is one where it helps you rig stuff automatically. Um, but very simply, I'm just gonna delete this for you. If I wanted to create my own rig, here's what I would do. And again, linking more tutorials in the playlist for you to understand it better. I would go to Shift A and bring in, um, go to Armature, bring in a single bone. 
And this actually might look a little bit different because I have some plugins installed that might look different, but single bone, bone, whatever, that's what we're looking for. If you see here, hold down Z, turn on, um, turn on wireframe mode. This is a giant bone, this is what we want. So if we scale it down, we bring it up a little bit to the center of the chest and make sure switching viewpoints up here that we're centered the great. We would hold, we would go to edit mode, tab, edit, and click on this little ball point, hit E to extrude. And we essentially just create our own rig. So just seeing what you were, what you saw before of like the little bones, you just kind of want to create bones in key places. Um, so you're able to control. And again, it might take some, some little um, trial and error, but for low poly mo models, it's super easy. You don't really have to worry about messing it up. You just want to go in and, and create some very basic controls. And there's so many ways you can do it. You don't need to connect them all. You can make them all separate and that kind of stuff. But just kind of showing you, you would very basically go through the entire body and create a shape just like I showed you before with how it was already rigged. And once you have it fully, you know, I, I would want to do the legs and whatnot. I would go back into normal mode, select my model, hold down shift, select my armature, which is what you would call the rig, hit command P and do armature deform with automatic weights. And what that would do is, is on very basic models. And if you do it right, allows you to very quickly rig something. And you'll see some weird things like here, how the leg is all messed up. It's cause they don't really do the full rig, right? It's very basic, but if you want to do something more complex, um, you can do something called weight painting, which if you select your object, hold on tab, go to weight paint, you'll see it comes up in this weird Brockhampton iridescent looking like thing. And essentially it's controlling the weights of your rig. This is complex. Honestly, I don't really even use it. I'm just showing you as an option. Um, rigging is super simple. I really recommend um, Mixamo for at least using uh, the basic rigging features to speed up your workflow. Um, but there's a ton of different ways to do that. One last thing I wanted to add though, is I wanted to add a little flashlight. So I made this little really simple flashlight. Again, it's, you can see it's a cube uh, that made a rectangle and then added another thing and, and uh, extruded it and attached um, a little spotlight to it. You can see that. Um, it's very simple, um, but I wanted to add this to his hand. So to show you how to do that is very simple. So we're gonna go to selecting the object. We're gonna go to our object constraint properties and add something, again, I'll redo this for you guys, called child up relationship. You see it's right here. And what this allows us to do is, is essentially like parenting it. If you don't know parenting with, in reference to like video editing, whatever, it's just kind of like, this is gonna follow another object, right? It's a child of an object. Um, so what we wanna do is essentially, uh, we're gonna take this and what's great, you know, if you already have a Mixamo character or your own rig, it should be all labeled properly on all the bones. If not, like for instance, if you see like I select here, it says right here, forearm right. And you'll see those on right on those bone properties. Um, you'd want to take a bone. So let's say for instance, our hand or whatever would be the closest bone to that, depending on your rig. And we're going to make sure it's, it's, it's named something properly. So hand right. So we know what it is. Hand right. Cool. We know which one that is. But we're going to take the flashlight, go back to our child of, and we're going to add in the rig as our um, target. And then it's going to ask a specific bone, which is why I asked about, um, or why I said about labeling it properly. So we're going to do it with the hand right, it's right here. And it's going to do some weird maneuvers for a second, but you're just going to bring it down into place. And just so you know, whenever uh, I'm like going into an object like this, what I'm essentially doing is, is to reframe it as you go to um, view frame selected. And I have Typically, it's on the period of your numpad as a key binding, but I have it set to my mouse, uh, the one that sides my mouse, so it's a really easy to maneuver, which is great for working in big scenes or things like this. So we're just going to move into what seems right, something like that. Cool. And so now if you see, if you go back to our character, go to the rig, go to pose mode, and move uh, either, you know, because this bone is going to that bone, anything, it's going to move with that hand. And it's going to move more precisely with the bone that we intended. So that's awesome. Um, again, for our sake, like I added, um, you know, this little flashlight to it. Uh, this will be available as a separate uh, object as well so for you to be able to use whenever you want. Um, I do not go into detail behind model it because it's like super simple. It's not anything crazy. If you watch other tutorials, you understand. Um, very simply, if you want to know though, like I took this light, which is a spotlight, 
and I parented it to um, the object, which is just selecting both objects, selecting the object you wanted to attach to last, and then command P, parent object, boom. And then it's gonna follow wherever it goes. So that's cool, a little extra little bonus thing uh, to add on. This, that, that same process it works for adding swords, for adding, for adding weapons, for adding anything you want your character to hold. Um, if we're doing an animation where suddenly a character holds onto it, sometimes it's a bit more tricky to, to, to change it so that way like it'll hook onto them. But very simply, if you go to, um, you know, here you can see that there's a little eye right here. And what this means is that it's on and off, right? But you can actually animate this on and off. And I'll show you how to keyframe stuff later in this tutorial. But just so you know, if you wanted to like, say it picks up the flashlight, um, you know, it's having it off and then turning it on. So very simply, um, but cool. Now we have our character. So now the next step is what is around him. So great, we have our character is looking great. Um, and what I like to do now at this point is start to lay out the scene. So very basically, we're just gonna add a floor. So we're gonna shift A, mesh, plane, and you'll see we have this little, this little, this little floor. We're just gonna scale it up to be a big, 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 big floor. And as you can see now, we got, we got it beneath him. And so what I like to do now here as well is add some texture. So kind of, I'll talk before about UV unwrapping, kind of very similar process. Obviously we're talking about a one plane kind of thing. There's multiple ways for you to go about this. You could actually take this plane, go to edit mode and subdivide it, you know, add control, control R and pulling up on the, on the um, scroll wheel, you can add a ton of new different ways to cut it up. That's one way to do it. Totally cool too, if you want to add some more variety of how you do it. But here we have this entire piece of plane. So we're going to texture to it. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna select all faces, hit A and edit and edit mode, hit U, unwrap, and then we're gonna go into our shader editor and we're gonna add a new material. And now this is adding a new material for this plane. So if you see, if we change the color of it, it changes the color, very simple, but we're actually not gonna be using that. You could use, you know, wherever you want here, but we're gonna do something even easier than that. We're gonna go and we're adding an image texture. So shift A, search image texture now we have image texture connect this node to the base node we're gonna lose color for a second and here's where it gets fun using this website i'm gonna show you right now this texture website i recently just found it it's an awesome resource of all these old seamless textures in that kind of low quality state as uh, as we've seen on uh on our other textures we've done before with our character um it's awesome because they're seamless and seamless is very important because as you'll see in a second where I'm just gonna take a one image of Dern, stretch it along this entire plane, it's gonna be repeated. So it being textured, or being seamless rather, hides a lot of those seams, obviously, and makes it just seem like one repeating texture and doesn't even look like, you know, like it's a scale down. So that's really cool. So we already have a Dirt one, it's gonna be available in the um, in, in the, in the uh, asset bin as well, but I'm just gonna find it for myself. So we're gonna go down here and here we have Dirt two. And great, so you'll see right now, it's you can kind of tell it's kind of a shiny. We don't want that, obviously, dirt is not shiny. So we're gonna go to our principal BDSF or BSDF, and we're gonna up the, the roughness, right? You remove some of that and move down the specular. You got a little, keep a little bit of specular, but you'll see that uh, if you remove some of the roughness we added in, it's you know, see we have, a, we have some reflections, specular kind of adds, so you get a little bit of that, and now it's looking great. So one thing you can do here as well is we already UV unmapped this, right? So if you go to our UV editor, now we see all these portions on our UV right here. And what we could do is very simply this. You can just scale it up. If you're looking at this, we scale it up, look how, look how the dirt just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So you can tell a little bit how it's repeating. Like over here, you can see a little bit of the lines when it's moving. But if you find the right mix, then you got a great looking floor. And if, and you know, you didn't have to subdivide it. Um, as I said earlier, you could, as in cut it up like this, you keep it the way it is. But what's nice about cutting it up like the way I did is that you can go in here with a little bit of some maneuvering, make sure you're, this is called your proportional editing, your shortcut is O. And what that what that does essentially is it'll kind of move everything around. If you hit G and open your scroll wheel, you see that like it's moving everything around it. So you can use this to kind of manipulate the ground. A little bit of, a little bit of, you know, some little bit of hills, you know, the ground's looking perfectly flat, Just add a little bit of stuff and it's going to be, it's not going to be the most perfect thing ever, but it's adds a little bit of, you know, dimension to what, 
to to your um, to your ground. So now we have some ground, right? Just a very basic floor, and obviously we can change the tweak this or whatever. But now we're getting a little bit of a picture of what we're going after. Now that we got the ground, it's time to add in some stuff to populate our scene. And obviously this is going to depend on whatever your idea is, right? But going back into my original concept, it's a, I want like a haunted house. I want like a spooky little vibe, a Resident Evil vibe, um, very much monster house. If you remember that movie. Speaking of which, I want to show you one of my favorite tools ever, Models Resource. This is an amazing website you haven't seen it before. That essentially is like kind of an open source catalog for pretty much any video game you can think of. All the models, the scenes, um, they're all here. And these are some of them are original ones that ripped straight from the game files. Some of them are recreations by fans. Uh, but it's a really cool resource to be able to see not only your favorite games and kind of uh, the models from them, but to learn a lot. And I think I first discovered this uh, right early, early on in my Blender journey. If you look at a lot of their YouTube tutorials for Blender, for music videos, that kind of stuff, they, they link this website. And I think something that's really important to say is that this is a really cool website for uh, gaining models and gaining experience uh, and using it to learn. However, it's not a place that you should use in a lot of your commercial work and a lot of any sort of like paid client work, uh, depending on the situation, because these are copywritten uh, things and obviously like we talked before in this tutorial like you don't want to just rely on assets all the single time you can uh but obviously like you don't want to just rip assets and use them as your own especially when you're paying them to have them as your own but i think this is an amazing tool in the beginning because for me like when i was just learning blender and like i wanted to make all sorts of cool scenes and like populate rooms and whatever like that's a lot of work <laughs> like sometimes assets aren't great if you want that quick low poly look like it's cool just to look up like look up like Smash Bros and have all the stuff from that game pop up and not only just not only the characters but the levels and the maps and like using that to learn I think is a really cool thing in the beginning to help you populate stuff and throw little Easter eggs. Uh, but again, it's not something you should ever rely on because it is copywritten and uh, and you know many people will consider it you know stealing to do that. But I think it's a thing you can use to learn. I'll show you exactly how easy to learn it. So that being said, I love this model of Monster House that I found. So I downloaded it, imported it into Blender just like I did with the last, with the character, you know, it was FBX. And now we can see we have the model in in Blender. It's looking great. Uh, if we go actually go into uh, wireframe mode, so Z and go into wireframe, we can see that this is a, actually a very simple model. Obviously it gets pretty complex down here, but it's really just like a cube that's cut up in those different pieces and whatnot. And if you look at um, the texture, the UV texture, um, it's so simple. Like, look, like literally the entire panel of the house is just this, is here, and and um, and the bricks right here just laid out very cleverly and how the UV unwrapped it. Um, and same goes to the windows. Look, the window, the door, the the chimney, it's all in one texture. It's super simple, and just like the same exact way as I showed you how I laid out the texture for the ground, it's essentially the same kind of thing. Obviously, it's a little bit more tricky. Um, as you get into it but it's essentially the same process of unwrapping part of the texture applying a material and applying an image material to that texture and then using the uv tool to kind of maneuver how it looks um but as i said earlier like these using the model resource is a great way to gain inspiration and kind of knowledge and if you're making an uh, uh, animation for yourself or something not for profit or commercial use like cool you can actually use them but can use the model that's great but ultimately you want to make your own models so what i did is i took this model this model's house model is great inspiration and i used it to make this model and obviously it doesn't look as great as the other one but if you look at the wireframe look how simple and clean this is this is like the most basic like shapes you can get i literally just took a cube and i scaled it up and i extruded and i scaled and i made a roof like and i just expanded from there and if you watch the frog tutorial it's kind of the same process obviously as character building but it's modeling I'm going to link a few tutorials as well as, as to get more into to modeling um, houses and those kind of things, but it's all very simple. Um, but, and there's a million ways you can do it, but as you can see, like it's very simple. And then what I did is I used uh, the texture website, like I showed you before. Um, and then I just found these textures that I liked and I added them and I, and I added um, UV on them. And then I just very simply took it and you can see it can just scale to however I, I like and I made a fit. And something about about that texture website is obviously it's not always going to be perfect. And along the same lines as um, as what I was saying about not wanting to use certain resources is because if you mesh too many 
assets together is going to look like it's not going to fit stylistically. Sometimes those textures you find are great textures, but the color, the tone, the tint does not fit what you want. Um, so I believe I took some textures from the website and I put them in Photoshop and just played with the tint and the contrast and made them look a little bit more like what I was looking for and make them match a little better. Um, but beyond that, it's very simple. It's kind of what I showed you. You know, these are all just faces of the model that I stretched out and applied the UB2 and applied the texture. These windows are just literally, it's, it's an image. It's image as plain. It's an awesome add-on to add on. Um, and like, that's all it is. It's, it's so simple. Um, and obviously like, again, you don't have to uh, model a house like this yourself at this point. Um, it's just a great way to kind of see how you can use that model resource website to learn. Um, this, this model is free for you to use as well for everything, not just this tutorial. Uh, but as you'll notice, the back is not complete because I'm lazy and I'm not going to fix that. And I don't need to. <laughs> and you don't need to, too, if you're working smart. I know I'm not going to see the back. Um, but, you know, modeling, obviously, that's pretty advanced. You don't have to do that. I just want to show you what's pos possible. But what you can do, that's not a model's resource, is use websites like Sketchfab. Sketchfab and Turbo Squid, those are the websites I referenced earlier about finding the, the player model. They have all sorts of amazing assets. I found this shipping container. I found this tree. I found this this car. You'll we'll see over here. Um, and most of them are available for free and with unlimited commercial use. So, so no, make sure you're checking the licensing for that. Some of you need to provide credit, which I'll do in the description below. Um, but it's as simple as that. And, I'm gonna, and these won't be part of the asset pack I'm, I, I uh, included for you guys, but you can download them at your, yourself. I include links in the description for that. Um, it's really up to you what you want to download. Um, and you know, there's paid ones as well. Like, you know, I think I, I purchased character models from Turbo Scoop before for like three bucks and it gives you rigs and all this kind of stuff. You know, sometimes I don't have time to model everything myself. Like sure, a container is very simple, but a car is a little more complex and I don't have time to model everything myself. So sometimes it's okay to buy assets or use assets when you're learning. Um, that's really important. So now it's time to populate your scene. So we're just gonna bring all these over to our little, um, little dirt patch right here right now we can see that it's bright it's pretty big so we're going to scale these down a bit um and put, put them over here we're going to bring the house over as well um and again this part kind of just is completely dependent on what you're looking for so i'm just kind of probably going to skip ahead a little bit as i kind of lay these things out um but very simply i'm using g and scale all these sorts of things and if you are moving something and you use if you hit G to move something and then you tap X, Y, or Z, you'll move the snap on particular grids, which I think is pretty, it's pretty useful. Um, so I'm just going to populate this scene how I want it. And I think it's kind of really up to you to have fun with it um, and add all sorts of stuff. And again, you can always add in things later on um, as, as you go about the process, but just kind of lay it out and kind of get the blocking down of what you're looking at. So our, our centerpiece is this house. So make sure that the scale is good with the house with the character um place it where you want and just kind of populate populate to your desire i'm going to fast forward a little bit now to when i have these things laid out and i'm going to add in another character and show you guys how i found that okay great so as you can see our scene is looking much more populated here Obviously, if you go over to rendered, we're not even lit it yet. That's fine. Um, but, you know, this is kind of where you can go and tweak things and play around with it. And again, we're not like, this is not the final look of it. We're going to do a little more steps before we get to that. But it's just kind of like, okay, now we understand what we're working with, where we are. And you can kind of inform every other decision we're going to make. I want to introduce you to a little new friend I found on, on I think it was on Sketchfab. Our little fish demon friend. This is what I'm saying about it. it's so awesome that you can look for assets that I previously made. Cause like, you know, I always want a demon like this, but like, I would not have thought of this fish demon thing. I think it fits this aesthetic greatly. Shout out to the artists that made this. Um, their link will be in the description too to download it as well. Um, but it's awesome. But here we run into one little problem. This is not rigged. And this is not something that will work in Mixamo. So I kind of showed you how to rig before, but I'm, just, I'm actually going to rig this right now in front of you guys so you can see. And like, I'm not looking for too much perfect control. As you'll see, something's going to be kind of pretty buggy actually. But all I want to be able to do is manipulate these legs and make them move so we can see them crawling on the roof. So really quickly, I'm just going to, um, we're, we're going to put them in this mode so we can see a little bit better. We're going to change our cursor, 3D cursor to beneath them. So when we add in stuff, it, it appears there. I'm not somewhere else in the void. 
Um, and we're going to go in, why am I blanking on this? Armature, single bone. And we're just going to lay out, we're going to turn the x-ray mode. Some very basic, oops, some very basic, um, some very basic armature. So again, not going to be perfect, but we're really just looking for control in the legs. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go to edit mode, add in this and just copy. Oh my God, I hate this sometimes. Okay, I'm, I'm probably going to fast forward a little bit of this part because it gets so finicky. Um, so this, you want to make sure sometimes you want to play around with your, your local and uh, pivot points because it can be really frustrating. Like now, make sure just kind of a general little thumb whenever you're like, like, you know, providing armatures or rigging things like this, just make sure the bones kind of fit proportionally within whatever you're trying to do. Like for instance, one of the legs, um, it doesn't always have to be connected. Uh, sometimes though, if you run into issues when you're, when you rig something and then you go to do the automatic, uh, modeling and kind of like be a little finicky, uh, it's probably because you didn't, you didn't, uh, you didn't add enough points. Um, as we saw with our example before, where like the legs were all messed up and whatever, um, it can be kind of annoying uh, at that time. So just something to keep in mind. Um, here we are. I'm just playing with this. I'm just gonna get one of these legs done, so you can see just kind of basically how I would do it. Um, it would be a lot more graceful than this. I don't know what is going on today. I'm really tired. Uh, we're gonna do that down. Just providing a little bit of control so we can maneuver the legs. Um, technically, you could animate this on shape keys, which I've seen a lot of people do, which again, I'll provide a tutorial in the description for people that want to do that. It's where essentially you don't even use armatures, you just use um, manipulating of the, of the mesh on certain points, which is very cool. Um, I haven't played around, I played around with it a little bit when I've, when I've had to like fix things in my models, but people have people straight up like fully animate it, which I think is so awesome. Okay, so we got one leg of these done. So I'm just going to take this, duplicate it, shift D, and I'm just going to, if it lets me, oh my God, just move it between leg and leg. And unfortunately, uh, because of the rights on this model, I don't think I'm allowed to just give you uh, my fully rigged one um, because I don't think... I can just upload that guy's model without his permission. Um, so I'm, I don't think I'll be able to give you guys this rigged version. Um, but if you follow these steps, it's pretty easy. And again, like, you know, if you don't follow this step, the the fish being able to move, this fish demon is not the end of the world. <laughs> if you can't get that part to work in this tutorial, I just want to show you the process. So I'm just going to fast forward uh, a bit right now as I just finish the rest of this armature. I'm just going to duplicate this on the other side, actually. Awesome, so I got the armature looking like how I wanted to. So what I would do from here is select my model, shift, select the, oops, shift, select the bone, part of the bones is, oh my God, it's a little tricky because that, there we go. Command P, automatic weights. And what that'll do is it'll, should properly uh, get everything ready. And as you'll see, like, this is not perfect. Like I move that, the tail moves. That's what you can kind of play around with weight painting or whatever. But like, again, for our purposes, like for, I told you the face is kind of deformed. For our purposes, it does what I need to do. Uh, but for some reason, when you're applying the armature or whatever, things are a bit tricky. So a lot of the times you need to make sure that uh, everything, your kind of, your any transformations you have are applied. So a good way to do that is select like your model, for example, command A, apply, transforms, all the transforms as well. Um, sometimes that's a big issue. Um, if, if that's happening to you, just re, uh, undo the uh, parenting of the armature, shift, or shift A, or sorry, command A, make sure all transforms are enabled, and uh, yeah, should be good. But here, here we have our spider, so we're just gonna slightly, we're just gonna slowly put them in uh, to where we need to, and again, we're in pose mode, moving these things around just like before, and very basic, laying him in. So now, you, I know he wants to be on this rooftop, and I want him to kind of overlooking because this is what our, our, our basic kind of movement which you're about to get into is, is him being on the rooftop. Cool. So our scene is looking great. Obviously, there's a lot more to do to this now, but now we understand what we're doing. We're looking at um, him exploring this haunted house and this creepy stuff. And there's a, a bunch of stuff you can add and you can add more. You can add more containers. You can add signs. You could add, I don't know, dead bodies. You could add whatever. 
uh, it's really up to you. But what I like to do now before we get into the basics of animating is kind of just laying down basic lighting. So on the basics of your of your Blender project file, if you go down here to your world view, you're going to have some sort of, I think it's default by gray or something like that, of sort of color. Um, now, right now, mine's actually disabled, but normally what it would show is like a world strength or whatever. I just set my world color to black. I just set it to zero. And what that does is if we switch over to rendered view, not that you can't see anything except that's a, that's a light from the flashlight. Oops. Um, and what this allows us to do essentially is give us like a playing ground for, for lighting. So putting our cursor to where we want things to be added in, we're going to shift A, add a light, and then we're going to go with area light. And if you go down here, the very bottom of this tab, we have our lights and we can change the power. I'm just going to put an overkill for now. Um, and if we switch to rendered mode, we can see now we're adding light into the scene. Um, so very basically what I like to do now is, is just play around with this, I keep playing with this thing, <laughs> is play around with the lighting here and just kind of get like a basic, a basic look kind of down. Um, and if we just go about and add a little bit more, um, here is where you kind of play around with lighting, playing with color. Like, let's make this one like purple. Let's make, let's add another one a little bit closer. Make this one green. We're just allowing a little bit of light to just kind of set the mood. And if we turn off uh, overlays, only on Z going up, we'll see that like, you know, we're only seeing what we're meant to be seeing. Um, so there's a lot of cool things you can do with that. Um, so I just like to lay down like a very basic to kind of set the mood. And the reason why I say basic now is that because once we go into animating our characters and our, and our cameras or whatever, we're understanding what we're actually looking at, that's how we can get more into detail about how we want to light up. Because we want to make sure that we're lighting our characters properly, which is with typical three-point lighting, which if you don't have three-point lighting, it's very similar to how you do stuff in live action. But we're going to be hitting our, our primary light, a secondary one, then a backlight, which I'll go into more detail later. Yeah, so we have the basic line now, we have the basic decorations down, so now it's time for arguably one of the trickiest part, which is animating. And it's not actually tricky, it's just going to be a little bit of learning curves. All right, so let's get into that. Great. So we have the scene is looking great, so now it's time for animation. So what's the workflow for animation? Well, there's a lot of ways to do this, it depends on your style. Um, and, you know, people animate, like I said before, with shape keys, with, with rigging, whatever. Um, but this is what I like to do. I like to start with key poses. Before we get into key poses and what that is, let's set up our blender for animation. So going here to the bottom left, make sure your timeline is open. Uh, this is the same place where we're editing our shape editor and whatnot. Animation, timeline. And you'll see here, this will open up. I'm probably going to have a less of a frame count, so you can increase the frames here. And again, what frame rate do you want to play at? Usually if you're, if you're matching to a music video, it's 23.976. Uh, which is what we'll we'll play back um, over here in, in our in our uh, in our render properties or sorry um, it's our output properties if we choose a frame rate uh, but you know say we're just gonna say th we're we're gonna say 300 right you know we're doing this one's actually gonna be in 30 frames um, for fun and we're just gonna call it even 10 seconds the whole animation is gonna run for 10 seconds so very simple we have that all laid out so we know start to finish it's gonna be 10 and we won't be able to tell now but it's gonna repeat right. So now we're on animating and key poses. What are key poses? Well, essentially, I mean, they are what they sound like. <laughs> it's a key pose of animation. If you were hand drawing the animation, right? You know, think of old Mickey Mouse days and Mickey Mouse was swinging a baseball bat and hitting a baseball. What you would do typically is to get the swing right and get the animation down is you would start with the first pose of him staying there with the baseball bat ready. And then you would finish or then the next pose you would do is the one where the baseball uh, or the baseball bat is hitting the baseball, that swing. And you would start on those two key poses, those are the big ones. And then you'd work backwards to fill in the gaps between those two poses to get the full animation of the swing down. Um, and, and you know, there's a whole idea about timing in there and how much frames you put into it. But what's cool about Blender is essentially that they'll fill in the data for you in between it, so you can kind of tweak it. But it's great to start with key poses, this is one, get the motion down, but two, to get understanding of the whole scene and what it looks like and what, what things are gonna be in frame, what's not, and to get things moving. So now you know the key poses, what they are and what they can do. So what are we going to do here? Well, this depends on what your scene is going to be like. For me, I know already what I kind of wanted to do. I want a scene where Sawyer is gonna walk up, walk up to this house, look up at the roof, 
see the spider, look down, and then walk to the house. Very simply, that's what I want to do. Those are my key poses. Him walking up, him looking up, him walking away. Um, so to get that, we're gonna do something, we're gonna start with something called keyframes. Keyframes, if you're if you're used to any sort of any uh, any software, Premiere, After Effects, CapCut, even like keyframes are just a way to, to gather data for a particular object or whatever it is, you know, location data. Um, so if we go to if we go to our, our armature, shift into pose mode, hit A to select all poses or all bones, um, and we hit I. This will let us lay down a keyframe. Um, and as you see, there's a ton of options here. Um, you know, you can individually uh, tweak the location, the rotation, the scale, all of it um, to help you as well. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start with location, rotation, and scale. We're not gonna play with the scale of our of our, of our character in this um, tutorial, but sometimes it's easy to forget to apply your scale or sometimes the scale's off or, you know, there's an old keyframe there. So I like to just lay down everything with a, with the scale just to be safe in case, you know, something's messed up. You don't have to though. So now we have that down, and as you'll see on our transform, all this information is now yellow, which means we're on an active keyframe. If we go ahead, let's say 50, and now this is this is the point where I want him to be have walked up to the, the door. Can I move him over here? Lay him down right here. He him down a little bit. Hit I again. Location and rotation. And now if you watch back, go back, hit play. It filled in the gap, just like I was saying, right? Obviously, it's not perfect. We don't want him to move that quick and that weirdly as how static he is, but it's great for laying down our key poses here, right? So then we're going to go in and we're going to add in a little bit more. So we're going to have him. Um, and again, it, it's cool because you can individually play with bones. So now we're going to go a little bit of head and we're going to make him look up. Playing with the rotation. Sometimes it's a little bit tricky. Make sure play with your global and local settings and make sure you're like on individual and local helps you individually locate a bone sometimes. Good to play with the settings. And we're going to lift up the arm and kind of looking at, we can see with this, this is a spotlight where it's going to hit. Now that's about right. We're going to obviously tweak it later, but now we have them looking up. So we're just going to you know, I could individually save each keyframe, but I'm just going to hit A and all. Do the same thing, location and rotation. And now it's a little fast, but we like that. So what you want to do is that now we're going to have him look down and walk forward. But before that, I want him to hold on him looking at the monster for a little bit. So we're going to select the keyframe we liked, shift D to duplicate, drag it. And now for these individual frames, we're, we're going to hold on it. Right? So now he's gonna look down, lower his arm, save that. Then he's gonna walk off. Oops. So now we're gonna switch back to global to make sure we're going to leave the plane. And boom. And simple as that. So let's play the whole back. We play the whole animation back. He walks up, aims a flashlight up, looks down, walks forward. Very simple. Obviously, it looks pretty horrible. Like, he does not look like he's walking, he's flying. And these animations are, are a little bit too fast and stiff and quick and all those kind of things. And that's okay. Our goal right now is not to fly to this animation. We're going to do that after. The reason why we keyframe is, is to understand poses, but also because once we know our, our camera angles, which is what we're going to do in a second, we might not need to animate everything. Like, you know, we only might need to animate, if we're just seeing Walker from like this angle, we don't need to animate him every single bone moving. We could just animate and do a little bit of visual trickery and illusions to make certain parts, you know, easier to animate. Now that we got the animation down for Soar, we're going to do kind of a very similar thing for our uh, our little monster creature over here. So I'm going to go in and fine tune all the legs later. But what I want to do is just basically the timing down of of him crawling up on this, um, oops, him crawling up on this on this roof uh, really quickly, uh, just so we get the movement down. So here's going to be his like final pose that Sawyer is looking at uh, when he has a flashlight on him. So I'm going to keyframe that. And then we're going to just have him just crawl up from the back of the, of the roof. Right. So as you see, he moves in. Not great. Looks horrible. But if you look at it all together, 
you see him moving up and it's time it's time a little wrong but he's a we're just gonna play around with it a little let's make let's make Sawyer not start from so far back that'd be a great start so we do this let's have him already moving right so we'll add in this a little quicker I just see we have a little bit of a down but now the most important part arguably is now we get some cameras in here so um there should already be a camera in your in your project file but uh let's add one in so shift a camera and now we have this little camera and if we go over here to this top right it's already open for me but if you hit this little plus and drag it'll open for you but we got another viewpoint and we can switch this to the camera viewpoint it's a little bit off right now let's set the camera to active so you're going to click on the camera and it's an active camera if you go back in here it'll work so now we see in this little little viewpoint we have our little camera if we maneuver we can do whatever we want something i like to do to help me as well is um is we go down here and we go to our camera settings and we go down to viewpoint display and this setting we turn up and this will hide everything outside the frame which is helpful because you are able to really understand the framing of your shot um and basic settings of camera you know that we have focal length i'm looking at this at 35 you can play around with that obviously wherever you want um and kind of going off the floor what's really interesting about uh keyframing and animating blender in general is that pretty much every setting you see you can keyframe so if i were to want to for instance do a shot where the camera zooms in i'm going to keep go over my focal length hit i now you see it's yellow which in that and the keyframe appears go a little bit more expand expand it hit i again and look what we have here a nice little zoom keyframe pretty cool right um, and that goes for everything. As I was, as I was explaining earlier about um, the flashlight in his hand, for example, um, if you go to object, this eye, we, we, we could hit, uh, hit I on the eye, ironically, and animate that and have that be a thing that moves. Um, it's really cool. It's really useful. Keyframes are pretty basic. You'll understand it pretty fast. Um, but now we're onto the camera. The big thing about the camera, though, is, is adding movement. So I wanted that opening shot, right, of us going in and revealing. So actually, this is going to be a little bit tight. It's going to be 50. And we're going to, you know, start up here with the camera looking up. Hit I. Rotation. Go a little down. Lower it. Change the rotation. Have it, have it push in a little bit. Hit I again. Now you'll see. Not perfect, but the camera's moving. We could add a little bit more keyframes. Oops. A little bit more. Of, and it's good, it's good to have this on local as well for this point because it'll move locally with camera. And I don't want to go that far in, but I do want to do this. All right. So now we have this. And another basic I want to introduce now, as you'll see, is that like, especially at the end, it's pretty harsh the way it goes in. It's not, it's not completely harsh, it's not a, not a standstill. But there's a lot you can do here with keyframes as you want to smooth things in. So if we select a keyframe, right click on it, we see we have this easing mode. And easing mode is exactly what it sounds like. If you want to ease the keyframe as in slow in going into it, ease in. If you want to ease out as in we're, we're starting a movement and we want to make it more seamless, ease out. And sometimes it's not going to be perfect for you. So what you can do is you can go into graph editor and play with the graphs. And this is pretty advanced if, if, if you know basic graphs and like after effects or whatever it's pretty similar um they've done a lot to play with this but it's it allows you flexibility usually i don't really honestly play with it too much um if you look at a lot of animations from playstation and that kind of stuff the cameras are very janky so it's fine <laughs> but there's a lot you can do you can also play with uh in interpolation mode which means that essentially right now we are on a a, a bezier interpolation which means that like it's going to ease in ease out but if we switch to linear this is going to be a straight shot See how just the camera just stops? It's straightforward. And then constant, which is another one which a lot of people animate on, which is essentially what it sounds like, which is that it's gonna be that keyframe until the next one comes up. Which is useful for certain things. It's also useful for animating. A lot of people like to animate on constants. That's more the traditional kind of method. Um, but you don't have to do that. For now, keep it a bezier, it's pretty simple. So now that's one cool shot, but I want more than that. I want a shot where we see that flashlight going up on the on the on the uh, thing's face, then a shot of Sawyer reacting to it. So 
how do we switch cameras? Very simple. So interesting, if we go back to the first frame of this, hit M, you'll see that a little a little marker appeared here, F, F whatever. And if we are on a camera that we already have as active and we go to marker, we actually bind camera to marker. And now see it says camera 02, which means that after this keyframe, we are now on this camera. So for instance, let's go a little ahead. Let's say around here is where we want to switch to a closer shot. Hit M. Duplicate your current camera, which is which. Um, sometimes it's it's going to also bring the um, the uh, uh, the animation down on it. So hit A, exit, delete that. And now we just have a static camera. We go to set active camera. We're on our current keyframe. Bind the markers. If we play it back. See how it just kind of switch cameras? That's cool. So now we can manipulate this. Let's get a cool little um, scary pose down over here. This is where you might want to tweak your animation more, your your blocking, your whatever. Um, let's actually make this wider too. I think I had this like 24 when I did it. Yeah, there we go. Maybe 35. So this is kind of lay down like what are we looking at and like here we go into kind of what makes an interesting camera shot what makes whatever like you, there's a lot more tutorials on that and not it's in blender just in general uh if you you know this is how you learn some basic cinematography but here are basically how to switch cameras so let's do another one where we want to do one of Sora's face let's add another marker duplicate this camera switch to it find camera to marker Okay, and then we got this one down. So we play it back very simply. Again, this is gonna look gross, but we're just using this for basic blocking, understanding of what we're doing. Camera comes in, switch to this shot, switch to his reaction, he leaves. Like, super simple. Um, it again, looks gross. The angles on our right, we need, we need to fix his blocking here, positioning. We need to fix this. But here we have a basic understanding of how the movement of the entire shot is gonna go. What is our scene? So what we can do here, from here, is we're gonna go in and fine tune everything. And so the base, the way I would do that is first, I would start with kind of the timing of it all. Uh, how do we get the timing right and all this kind of stuff? How do we make, um, you know, him appear at the right time and the flash out, there's enough, there's enough frames for everything. And this, honestly, if you're not just following this tutorial, this is gonna be something that you're just gonna learn over the time. Understanding what makes good animation, what's good timing, what's good everything is just kind of a flow you, you understand over time. Um, but I just, I just like to start with the block, even though it looks horrible. Let's me just picture what I need to know. And what's cool about the camera angles too, as, as you go into it further, as I said earlier, like as I fine tune this animation, I'm walking around, I don't need to animate the bottom of his feet because you're not going to see it. You're just going to see his hips move. So I just need to move a little bit of movement for out to work, everything. And that's it. So what I'm kind of going to do now is I'm just going to kind of give you a, a quick time lapse of me kind of maneuvering things and I'll kind of I'll stop any point of any point of things I want to say and kind of talk over it but honestly this is kind of just the longest part of the process which is going to be up to you and what you, need, what you want to do personally I showed you all the tools um it's pretty easy um it just takes takes some time to get right into your liking so we're just going to fine-tune that and then we're going to some final lighting touches which I'll talk about and then we're going to finish with some just final looks I'll be honest, my recording here kind of messed up. It kind of jumped around a bit. Uh, so there's some chunks missing, but you know, I think this part is pretty self-explanatory. Just kind of filling in the gaps and getting the timing and the flow and of everything right. If you're having trouble with that, if it's a blender and this kind of stuff is your first kind of foray into to, to filmmaking, as you would call it. I think the best way to kind of learn more is beyond trial and error, is looking at references, looking at other amazing 3D animators, seeing how they composite, how, how they kind of move scenes around, how everything flows. Another tips I would say is just that like, you might need to export things and kind of, you know, see it in full time and real time to understand the flow better. And also what you'd keep in mind is that when you're playing things back, if you're doing with an intense scene on rendered mode, um, oftentimes the lag will kind of hit the FPS. So make sure on the top left, when, when uh, you'll see any sort of screen when you're playing something, it'll tell you the FPS. Uh, make sure it's playing back at the correct speed because in the beginning, it definitely messed me up a few times when I um, thought things were moving slower uh, than I th they actually were because of the FPS, which is actually just dropping. Uh, so just something to keep in mind there. But yeah. Okay, great. So we are back. Now I added a ton of stuff. I moved a lot of things around as you'll see, but I think the biggest change you're going to notice is that the lighting, this looks so much better. So how did I do that? Um, I just added, let's, let's look at these. 
I just added some lights, um, some backlights, some green lights, played around with the color. Um, you could just see that I just went around and kind of tweaked it. I think like, as you, we thought before, like lighting is what's gonna transform a bad render to a good one. Like, as is always the case, like, um, so I think it's pretty important that you kind of fine tune your lighting. I'll try to, I'll try to uh, find a few tutorials for you to add to the giant playlist, but really like I just learned lighting from basic lighting, from understanding lighting from live action stuff. It's very similar, um, but to kind of show you the different examples of lights in here, you know, we just have, I might have gone on this already, but just to kind of re to reaffirm it, like we have area lights, spotlights, sunlights, point lights, um, areas are kind of what the most typical one you would use. It's obviously to light an area um, and play around with a lot of it, like really play around with adding lights in subtle ways. Like, you know, here I have these little point lights that are just for lighting up this side of the house to add a little bit of color. Um, playing with color is really important too. I think that can add a lot and make your renders look next level. Um, and a good note too, just like animating anything else, you can animate lights, right? You can have them come in and out, increase, decrease in, in intensity, whatever you want. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, and I, th I hope I showed you good enough uh, kind of my animation process, but really as if I didn't explain it well enough before, I deleted my my animations like I would just continue the a the, the key pose route so for instance like him walking right what I would do is I would just get a key pose of his leg going one direction he's like going other direction and just repeat those to mimic walking and it's not great but here's the thing about the camera angles let's look at this for one second let's hit play cool looks great simple walking nothing fancy but now watch the left see how janky that actually is but you can't really tell. I mean, you can tell a little bit, but it, 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 it hides it pretty well. And that's because you just be smart with how you animate things. That's why I love uh, fine tuning things after I do the camera movements, because I don't really know what's being seen. Save time. Um, but that's kind of it. I would just continue on my key poses and work backwards. You know, I have a key pose and walking up and then walking away. Now let's do a middle pose of where his legs would be and just kind of work backwards. And a lot of times you can trust the process of of lender uh filling in frames for you to kind of do that um i think another thing to keep in mind if you're new to animation is kind of focus on secondary actions like for instance for example you know we're not even seeing this animation uh, in the shot but uh we see that he's looking up we see that he's looking up right but at the same time also moving his hands and that you know again we're not even seeing this but it adds a little bit of movement it makes it feel not as stiff um and that applies for a lot of things like you know like whenever he's moving his legs make sure other parts have been moved just kind of add a little movement so things feel more natural i did a lot of that for the spider as well where along the same way of how i how i got him to animate his legs i just i did the big poses first so legs all the way extended legs all the way not extended and having things move uh in surprising ways where like for example like here he jumps up to to grimace from the light but i move his i move his tentacles too adds a little bit of more life and like, you can go as crazy as you want with that, add as much detail as you want, but that's kind of it. One important change I kind of want to emphasize before I forget is kind of how I change a lot of these, let's roll it back, how I change a lot of these trees to kind of cover more of the frame. And the reason why for that is that with anything, you know, with any sort of shot or whether it be live action, animation, whatever, it's great to have um, depth in your shot, right? So we have trees that are really close to the camera, trees that are far away, and then our, our, our subject, this house, is in the center behind these trees. And adding that depth is really cool, um, but it also it just helps a lot. And having movement and depth in your shot is something that's really important. One thing too is I add a little a bit of depth of field on this camera. What does that mean? So you see how, how this house is in focus, but this is not uh, the tree. Uh, typically on any camera you have in Blender, it's going to automatically uh, have everything in focus but if you go to your camera setting so click on your camera go down to your settings down here let me maneuver this so it's easier to see you'll see a setting called depth of field um, so you check that and what that allows you to do is you can either choose an object to focus on so in our case our house so uh, we could literally see how it's blurry right now select a house and boom it selects that or we can do by distance so you can change the distance um, sometimes it's a bit tricky, uh, you know, with certain objects, so it's easier to, or for instance, if you're, if you're tracking an object, it's great to have the focus stuck on the object rather than just a distance. Um, but of course, you can always animate the distance as well. And then you'll play with the aperture. The aperture, if you understand cameras and lenses, it's just 
how much of the light is being led into the lens, which allows for a greater blur. So let's look at, uh, for example, this this branch. If we uh, increase the f-stop, now there's less of a blur, but if we lower it all the way, now we have a nice little blur. So that's something to play around with a little bit. Um, and I think it adds a lot of just a little bit of extra stuff. I think technically speaking, you know, these places in your games, if you really have this technology, because it's known to be pretty advanced, but I think this along with lighting and some movement adds so much to your animations. I really recommend playing around with it, um, especially on the shots where we play with depth because it will just transform your shots. So now that we have our animation cleaned up, our poses cleaned up, our lighting cleaned up, our scene cleaned up, we are good to hit the final, final looks. So what are that? First of all, that's our render settings. Make sure we're on the right render settings. And two, um, it's hitting that pixel look. So let me run you through my render settings right now for this particular one. I know I didn't talk about it too much in the beginning, but I don't think it really matters till now. Um, we're in, e in Eevee, of course. Uh, if you don't know the difference in Eevee, you didn't really pay attention to the button in the Dolores tutorial. Um, Eevee versus Cycle. Cycle just creates way more realistic shadows and lights and how it interacts and reflections than Eevee. Uh, Eevee creates fake shadows and lights or, or and reflections. Um, Cycles is, is aesthetically better, but it takes way longer to render. Eevee is perfect for what you need to do for doing these retro looks. Cycles is overkill. I use Cycles every once in a while when I want to do like image renders or single renders. But I'm doing animations, I never use Cycles. It will literally transform your renders, like save you like 10 times the amount of time. I know realistic lightings and reflections is interesting, but you don't need it. But to go down our, our render properties, I have Bloom on. Bloom, um, just, you know, adds a little bit, you can see a little bit on the flashlight here, just adds a little bit of a halo to bright lights and you can change the threshold. So it's more, you know, more things are kind of bloom, um, tweak it to your liking, but I think it adds a lot, makes things look a lot prettier than if it was off. Um, you can play around with different colors to the bloom as well. Motion blur, I don't always love to have this on, but I do like to keep it at certain times when there's a lot of movement, it just kind of makes things look a little more cinematic. Um, obviously, I believe a lot of early PS1 games didn't even use motion blur because that's too complex, uh, but it's thing you can play around with it. You can play around with the shutter to make motion blur more intense, less intense to your liking. Um, film is another important setting. Making sure your filter size is set to the lowest as possible is really important. I think by default it is set to 1.5. Uh, the lower filter size will allow you to have more sharp edges and create that more uh, pixelated look. Uh, transparent, it's totally up to you. It's just, essentially you will make your background transparent, obviously. Um, for our for our differences, if we just if we export this out as transparent, add a black background, it'd be the same. Uh, but just keep it off. You don't need it in this setting. Color management is up to you as well. I like to keep it as filmic, and I like to keep my contrast either medium high or high. Um, you can play around with your exposure if you want. That's really up to your own liking. To be honest, a lot of things I'll tweak in post in my actual Premiere or your editing software of choice to fine tune it more. Now to our output settings. Now, this is totally up to you. You want you can put a folder, so sort of folder wherever you would like it. Make sure it's somewhere concise because uh, what's gonna happen is that it's going to export out individual images for every single frame. So you don't just want to put this on your desktop, otherwise you're gonna have 300 images on your desktop. Put it somewhere singular in a in closed folder, up to you. Um, I like to keep mine as, as a PNG sequence. Make sure the alpha's on in case you use the transparent stuff. Uh, keep this as, as is. And um, going back down to, you know, the color stuff is, is the same thing as before. And probably the biggest thing you're curious about is a pixel look. So what's interesting is that um, I'm going to link this tutorial by Brawler. He's an amazing animator. If you haven't seen his work, he probably has. He's probably one of the best to do it right now. Creates a really awesome, simple tutorial about how to achieve um, a pixel look in your compositing setting. So if you go to compositing up here, essentially with a video, the video will run through all the steps better than I could right now because he explains more detail everything. But essentially by creating this level of nodes, it's going to allow you to tweak the pixels, uh, this pixelated look. So we actually hop, say we did, we added in all our, all our pixel stuff. We could hop out to our main view, go over here on one of your panels to the right, this little arrow. And now we see we have a compositor setting. This is brand new in the newest updated Blender. If we switch it to camera, it's actually going to add that pixelated look to our camera. So this should already be on a race. Let's increase it to, to have a little example. 
so now we see it's actually it's actually on and compared to like this view which is the normal view it's completely it's completely normal but here we have it with the render settings on i've noticed that sometimes uh this can actually overshoot the amount of pixels it actually is going to be so like like if i render it out this one's pretty accurate but sometimes when you're playing with different resolutions it can actually be pretty ac inaccurate and, and kind of over overestimate it so it's a cool way to see it simply in, in your in your real-time view what it looks like but if you really want to test out a pixelated look i'll go to render render image to see that out before you render it all the way out but cool so it, have the brawler video breakdown how to add these notes how to do everything very simply here um an extra little thing that i discovered which i'll link a separate video to is adding in uh, your own kind of template um so i kind of save those nodes into a group uh which you could do by if i open it up oops i select everything and i believe there's a shortcut for it but i can make a group right here it's command g um it'll allow me to make a group and i could essentially make that group a template and it's kind of tricky but i i'll link a youtube shorts video how to do that for the future but if I hit Command A or Shift A, I could add the nodes. And all I have to do is, is connect them to what's already there and boom, I have the pixel look. Super easy. I really recommend it. It's an awesome kind of time saver for things. But with that out of the way, you, you have all everything you need to know. You have your pixel look, you have all your renders set to ready to go. So all you need to do is hit render and render animation. And that's gonna run through and create a frame for every single uh, frame of your animation export out to wherever you put it and the next step and the final step is bringing into your editing software of choice i'm going to be using premiere for this step however it's pretty you can use it in any, in any editing software how you import it might be a little bit different but um if you're using sort of editing software and it's you don't know how to do this like let's look up your editing software how to import images as sequences that's all you need to do and then i'll show you how to do it let's hop in premiere and show you what i would add in some final touches but now we're in Premiere, and again, for this step of the process, it's you can use whatever software you want. All we have to do is essentially take the frames that we just exported, put them in a sequence, add some touches. Simple as that. So if we're in here in Premiere, we'll just go to Import, uh, find your your folder wherever it is, and you'll see that now it's just a series of images, and it should be as many images as your as your frames are. But we go to Show Options, Image Sequence. And make sure this is checked. And what this is going to do, make sure you select the first image. What this is going to do is that it's just going to read all these images as a video. So if we select the first one, make sure this is selected under hide options, hit import, and boom. Now it's in our it's in our uh it's in our program. One thing to check though, sometimes if you're using different frame rates, sometimes it doesn't always accurately uh, decipher what frame rate you're playing at. So in Premiere, an easy way to change this. You right click, interpret footage, and then make sure the frame rate is set to what you like. So for instance, 30 is what we're gonna play with. And so now it's gonna re, re time out that animation and play at 30 FPS. So what I do from here really depends on the video. Sometimes I'll just add, let's create a sequence from here. Sometimes I'll just add in some basic coloring, uh, tweak some stuff, make, make a match or grade. Uh, you could do a lot of things like retime uh, certain things. Like, you know, if I wanted, um, this shot to go faster. Boom, now I have that. You know, you can play around with it, you can do whatever, you could, you could make things go faster. It's really up to you. Um, this is kind of basic, I just wanna show you what it was like to import that back in. Um, and honestly, that's kind of it, guys. You made your first animation, how did it feel? That's pretty crazy. Plus, you did it, you made your first low poly animation in Blender, you understand the process, you saw it through it. I'm sure you don't understand every single step yet, but you will, I promise you. Um, thank you guys so much for watching, hope it helped. From here, I recommend you just try and make your own animation from start to finish. It's not gonna be perfect. Don't try to push yourself too much, don't do anything too complex. Keep it simple, but just see if you can make it on your own. I think one thing that helped me a lot in the beginning as I learned Blender was for every tutorial I did, I then would make my own thing learning what I used from the tutorial. Sounds pretty basic, but I think it helps you feel like you're making progress. Like for instance, uh, when I did the frog tutorial, after I did that, was the first time I made the first uh, 3D model of Steve, which is now no longer um, used, but I, I, I took what I learned from there to make that, and I still barely knew Blender. Um, but I think kind of doing that step by step kind of helps you feel rewarded and, and it makes you understand your, your learning, your, 
it makes you feel like you're making progress. Um, but at the same time, like keeping this one step at a time because there's so many different things in Blender you can learn and use and it could be very overwhelming. Take it one step at a time. Even now today, I learn one new thing in each animation I do. I'm slowly advancing my uh, process and it's gotten to a point now, which is crazy to me that like, I can like think in Blender, <laughs> if that makes sense. Like I'm speaking a language. I'm like, if I see something or if I think about an idea, I'm like, how do I do that? It's like, oh, I could add an optic constraint and I do that and blah, blah. It's like nerdy shit. Like it's crazy. Like, like literally a year ago, I couldn't understand what a UV meant. And like now here I am mapping stuff, which is crazy. And you will get there too if you, if you stick with it. Probably faster than I did, honestly. Um, but yeah, from here on out, I would just follow more of the tutorial of the playlist. We lost your roles in there. Um, <clears throat> learn stuff step by step. I think also just like look at inspiration, look at other artists. Like there's so many amazing artists. There's Brawler, Bryson McBee is a good friend of mine. Um, Lord Stingray, like a million artists um, that are out there that are making low poly stuff. I think it's really cool to look out for inspiration. Inspiration not in terms of like copying them, but seeing that like, oh, they did this and like, that's pretty cool. What if I want, what if I want to try something like that or seeing what's possible? Uh, Cause it's really cool to see that, understand what's possible and then to, to use it to inform your own art and going to that and then just getting inspiration from that. Um, I think is a, is a really important part. Uh, and that's just like doing research. Is just doing research on Pinterest and finding things, watching old video games, seeing things. Um, it's all part of the process. But yeah, I hope you learned something, guys. Keep at it. Um, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments or feel free to DM us for our uh, specific stuff. Uh, many more tutorials coming in the future. Um, for more in-depth stuff, don't forget to check out our Patreon, which we just launched. Uh, we're probably going to be breaking down our Mii Fighter video first in there. I'm just going to show you the whole project file, give you some assets from that for you to use yourself um, and answer questions. Um, thank you guys so much for the support. If you don't like the Patreon, just watching this video, leaving a like, leaving a comment, subscribing, just means the world to us. Thank you so much. We are here for you, for your Blender journey and creative journey. You got this, guys. We're here to help along any step of the way. Uh, please feel free to uh, message us. Let us know how it's going. Uh, if you need any help or just whatever, we're always here. Discord is available as well for more stuff like that. Um, just keep going at it, man. And again, going back to what I was saying earlier about like understanding that like you know, not everyone can be a jack of all trades forever in Blender. Obviously, it's great as an end goal to be there to be able to fully from scratch model every single thing in a scene and animate it in a rig or whatever. But know your strength as, as, a, as a creative. Like, there are people out there that are amazing, like can make the, make, make the most amazing textures, but don't know how to model, who don't know how to animate. And that's totally okay. That doesn't mean they're a bad artist. It means that their strength is this. Like, it's the same thing when you approach a film. Like, not everyone can be the most amazing director director of photography, editor, sound designer, um, gaffer, like it, it's, you can, it's okay to have a particular strength. And what I mean by that too, is that in the beginning, like, don't be afraid to, to rely on assets that you have proper use for, uh, in your learning process and, and to help you kind of jump certain steps and, and to level ahead and keep things moving forward or, or, or hiring friends to make your models. Like I hired Bryson to make, uh, the Curtis and Tia models, which should an amazing job way better than i ever could um and that was really cool and like understand like my strength like as an animator and not that like it's okay to do that like don't let your ego get in the way of certain things like again end goal is you don't just want to take models from the models resource use it as your own say it's your own and rely on that no use it as a learning experience but don't be afraid to use it in the beginning as a, a stepping stone for sure um and yeah just keep at it guys one step at a time you guys got this we're here and don't forget most importantly they don't